Look at these wonderful people. <laughs> we are so happy to be here. Movement is one of my favorite subjects that I know we're all obsessed with it in some way or the other. Um, and look at the movement in the room. I mean, look at the movement. It's bombarding off the roof, off the walls. The thoughts, the emotions, the instincts, the rhythms. You know, it's colliding all over the place. And that's the fascination. So tonight we're going to have a wonderful discussion uh, about character, using movement and physicality to create character. My name's Tom Bentley Fisher. Uh, I'm a Canadian, eh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, you Canadian? Good. How about them Canucks? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm new to Los Angeles, I'm new to, to California, but I'm, I'm so happy to be here. My experience has been as an artistic director of theatres uh, across Canada and in Europe. For the last uh, eight years I've been working out of Barcelona, working on multilingual productions and uh, having them uh, perform both in Canada and in Barcelona. I'm also a teacher, I've been teaching for many years. I had the great privilege of being mentored by Yat Momgren at the London Drama Centre, uh, and uh, I love teaching. Presently, I am also the co-artistic director of Waterfront Production House and Playhouse in Berkeley, working with Rachel Adler, where we are fusing the work of the Meisner work and the Yat Momgren work to create, hopefully, a whole new technique of training. Anyway, that's me, but here's them. These are the interesting people. Uh, can I ask you to uh, simply introduce yourselves and give a synopsis, just a quick sketch of what is your discipline, to who you are. Where you go, David. Thanks, Tom. Uh, first of all, before doing that, thanks to the organizers for having this conversation and thanks to you all for coming out on a Tuesday. <laughs> wow. Um, so I'm David Bridell. Uh, I am currently the Dean of the School of Dramatic Arts at USC and uh, previously the director of the MFA in acting at USC. Um, I think what I should tell you is that uh, I've had a long career as an educator, uh, uh, additionally a playwright, director, and choreographer. And uh, early on in my artistic uh, journey, I met uh, a very famous clown teacher by the name of Philippe Gaulier. I studied with Philippe for some time and uh, have pursued clowning as an additional aspect of my work ever since. I run the Clown School here in Los Angeles, and um, I don't know if that'll come up this evening. It's quite possible that it'll be part of what we talk about. It might not. Uh, but uh, at SC, I teach movement for actors. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and looking forward. Sarah. My name is Sarah Elgard. I'm a choreographer and director and a writer. I uh, don't know what more to say about myself. Um, I do site-specific work. I do work for film and television. And I make dance films, and I write about dance films. And I am the executive producer of an online um, international dance film festival called Dare to Dance in Public, which Vincent Patterson here on my left is one of our esteemed judges this year. And um, I'm I trained all over the world, and but the most sort of um, formative of my training was at the school of um, Pina Bausch at Wupp in Wuppertal, um, and or outside of Wuppertal. And I went there for a year, and my life changed, and my approach to dance and theater and movement changed entirely from that point on. And I work um, extensively, or have worked extensively, with special populations, creating movement theater that is based on their experience and based on their real world movement as human beings, non-dancers, non-professional dancers, um, such as transitional homeless women, women in prison, battered women, and recovering substance abusers, teens and adults. So uh, that's a bit about me. And I'm excited to be here and talk to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Vincent Patterson, and I am a director and choreographer. I began as an actor and a director, and then got into dance in my early 20s. Um, I spent 17 years choreographing and directing for Michael Jackson, 11 years with uh, Madonna. Uh, I created many, many things that you probably know, but had no idea that they came out of my insane brain. Um, 
Uh, directorially, the last several things I've done, I created uh, in, well, this is a little while ago, but in 2004, I directed the first original production of Cabaret to be done in Berlin, and it's still running, uh, 2017, so that's 13 years later. Last year, I directed and choreographed uh, the musical Evita at the Ronecker Theater in Vienna. It was an extremely successful run. It was supposed to run for three months, and it ran for 12. Um, I also direct opera. I directed Manon here at the LA Opera that Placido uh, Domingo conducted for me. Um, my background, I've taught acting. Um, I try to uh, teach dancers how to become actors and I try to teach actors how to put movement into their vocabulary. So that's a bit about me. Thank you, I'm very honored to be here and especially with this esteemed panel. Hi, I'm uh, Jean-Louis Rodrigue, and um, thank you for having us all here. Uh, I'm so excited to be part of this panel. I think it's, uh, I've been a fan of even yours. <laughs> I, was, I had no idea who he was. Um, anyway, I teach at the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television, and I teach something called advanced movement, but most I teach the, something called the Alexander Technique, and I've specialized taking this interesting process to helping actors embody their character. And um, I work in theater, in film, and television, and I travel all avenues. Um, I teach a lot in Berlin. We have quite a European panel here, most of us have come f from Europe, or the, the British islands. <laughs> and um, I, I d I'm very interested in the global aspects of and power of performance. And I think uh, you guys have an enormous power to communicate characters. Uh, I'm here because I want to help characters come to life. I just did... Uh, prepared uh, Margot Robbie, I don't know if you know who she is, and she's playing Queen Elizabeth. And it's, uh, it's the first thing that she's ever done in, on that level. And um, I realized that you have to cross boundaries, you have to use everything that you know. I originally trained as a dancer, so I'm very excited that all of you are here. Uh, but I also want to uh, focus also when I'm talking to you on how to make you more flexible, get rid of your habits, and realize that your body uh, communicates 75% of the story. I'll, we'll talk more about that. But that's who I am. Thank you. And isn't that wonderful who you are? Thank you so much. So I think you can see that we have uh, an extraordinary panel. Talent here is incredible. They're at the forefront of their fields, and they are investigators, it's very clear to me. Investigating what? <laughs> we're going to find out. So tonight, we're talking about movement. We're talking about gesture, we're talking about physicality. Are physicality and movement the same thing? Who knows? We're looking, we know that everybody in this room is different. Everybody exposes themselves through an inner movement and an outer movement, and that's wonderful. I mean, we're all, it's wonderful, right? Uh, but how do we find that? How do we help the actor? How do we investigate so that that movement belongs to the actor, so that the movement is not put on like a hat? Or maybe it is put on like a hat. Who knows, right? But it's such an interesting exploration. What is movement? And as uh, Jean-Louis said, it's there, it's internal, it happens, it is revealed, there are no secrets. So how do we do this? What is movement? How can we incorporate it? How do we explore and develop our inner resources so that the movement is revealed in service of the character, not imposed on the character? What are the accidents of movement? There's so many questions, but first of all, let's just start with, all right, here we are. Uh, and perhaps, Jean-Louis, you could begin. Um, I'd like you just to tell our audience, what is the means that you use 
What is the means that you use both to investigate, to discover, to help the artist discover the movement inside him or her, and then allow that to transform to the physicality of the role? If you... Sure. Um, I feel a bit strange talking about, about movement, and we're all sitting down. <laughs> but we're all moving. Uh, but uh, I'll go to the edge of my chair, and maybe that, uh, that, that will help. Um, I like to start with the foundation, with your skeleton. So everyone in this room, everyone that's watching, you're all feeling your own skeletons right now, and you're feeling your own energy, and you're feeling your own breathing mechanism happening right now, yes? Yeah. So I start thank God with that. For that I, right? I, <laughs> what? I said thank God for that. For, I, so when I work with actors, I need to know what they have to offer, the good things, and I also want to know what gets in the way. And um, usually when I'm working, you, you're talking about working on a project, correct? On a character. So yes. the material is there, the text is there, but now we have to take the words and actually make them live in space. We have to figure out a way of bringing the words into the body. And we're all different. There's no one in this room that's the same. And it doesn't matter whether you have an Oscar at home or whether you're a beginner. We, ha we do have some interferences. And I get to it right away. What is it that I can do t to help you? So I made some notes here. What I do is I, I think of our body like a piano. So if the piano is not tuned up, I can't do a thing. You know, it doesn't matter how much talent I have, the notes are gonna be off tune. So I work through the Alexander Technique, which is an incredible method to enhance awareness for the actor and even for the director. It helps the director to see what, what are some of the interferences. Now, that's a good question, right? Tension, how many of you have tension? Let me see hands. Yeah. How many of you have, uh, you wish that you could breathe deeper or have a more resonant voice? Yes. <laughs> and, and your emotions are expressed by the body, by your body. So if you're tense or if you have habits that interfere, that get you off tune, that is not going to work out. So I start with that. I start helping the actor become more aware. I help them open up. The, uh, the Alexander Technique has to do with lengthening the spine, releasing the joints. Um, Alexander was called the breathing man. He, you know, he was an Australian at the turn of the century. He spent all his life uh, developing the Alexander Technique, and I, um, I was blessed to get that gift given to me so I could help myself, but also help actors. That's one of the important things that I do. Um, specifically to develop the character, I, I like to use archetypes, because the archetypes, your body is like a map, and archetypes live in your body. Uh, for example, if uh, somebody was playing a mother in this group, where do you think the hot point of that mother would be? Any ideas? The heart, the, the, the stomach. What do mothers do a lot with uh, hands? They know how to use their hands. So I would work with these, locating these hot spots in the body that really help tremendously, and they get to it. The other thing that I've become famous in this town, and I take it as, as a compliment for, for me, is that I like to use animals as a base also for characters. So um, that also helps the character 
come out. You know, often we say someone is a snake or someone is really a pig <laughs> or acts like a pig, right? And, and so that's other methodology. The important thing is for me to be ex experienced and be able to take all this material to the character and get to it. Sometimes I have only a few, a few days. I'm working on a project now. I have the whole month. <laughs> which is beautiful, very rare. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's go down the line. Again, very specifically, you have tools. Tools to help the actor locate or the dancer to locate. And then how do you develop that? Do you want to have a go at this? Please. Sure. Um, okay, I say, you know, I've been doing a lot of these lately, and uh, I keep being asked, especially from the choreographic perspective, what advice do I give to dancers? What would be the first piece of advice? And my first piece of advice to dancers is get into an acting class. Well, my first piece of advice to actors is get into a dance class. Either get into a dance class, take a Pilates class, take a yoga class. When I first started dancing, I was 23 and a half, I had been an actor only, and I looked at the world through my eyes. I didn't realize I had a body attached unless it was something hurting me, you know. Once I started to dance, I started to realize that I was a three-dimensional form that moved through space, and I was surprised that all those years I spent as an actor from 10 to 23, that I didn't really know about using my body as a tool, because our body is just as important physically as our voice. So what I try to do with an actor is to make them realize that everybody is unique and that only by realizing your own individuality as a human form can you use this body to have the power that you want to assert yourself whatever role that you're playing. Um, predominantly, I think that in real life, we do the same thing that we should do as actors. Uh, we ask these basic questions to ourselves, and the ones that I ask the actors to know when they start to work with me in any scene is um, to first know your objective in the scene, to second know where you are so that you can own the space physically and psychologically, third know what you want from the other character, fourth know what your obstacles are, and five play to win. Because this is what we do in real life, whether we're talking to AT&T on the telephone or we're trying to have a relationship with someone. Once we know what we want and we, want and we know what the obstacles are, then we have to find out how to get it. A lot of actors come into the room and they say, I think my character would do this, as opposed to, and I always come back to them with, well, I really don't care what you think your, uh, your character would do, what would you do in this situation? Because each one of us, as you just said, and you'll probably hear this from all of us, each one of us is completely unique. And it's only by understanding who we are and how we operate in the real world, and I mean that three-dimensionally, since that's what we're talking about, can we find the purest version of ourselves to make ourselves, as actors, the most unique we can possibly be? Um, I'll give you an example. I, I, I'll, use, I'll cite Evita, for instance. I'll, I'll cite two examples. Um, there's the first scene when Juan Perón and Eva uh, Duarte meet each other. And uh, Juan, the actor that was playing Juan Perón said to me, well, I think he would be like this. I think he's a general and I think he's very strong. And, and I said, yes, but what were you like when you fell in love with your wife? Because Juan Perón sees Eva Perón, and it's like Romeo and Juliet. He is instantly struck. He's instantly taken over. And he said, well, I felt like a kid. And I said, okay, that's a great start. So here's a general who has a stick up his ass and is trying to impress everyone with his physicality and his strength. Yet all of a sudden, he sees this woman, and he turns into a 12-year-old. He turns into a 16-year-old. So how can you now take that information and let's play with that. Let's play with yourself as a 16-year-old. What kind of activity would you do? What kind of action would you have? Would you, how would you approach this woman? 
if you wanted to approach her with a sense of love and a sense of vulnerability. This totally gave him a whole new perspective on how to move himself through space and how to relate to Eva Peron. Uh, let me give you an example of Eva, for instance. Um, I ask actors to, to tell me what parts of their body do they find to be the most essential or what parts of their body do they find that they, uh, with which they have the most power. Uh, in this same scene, I said to the actress who was playing Eva Peron, okay, you're meeting him, you've fallen in love, you're trying to seduce him. What part of your body do you think is the most attractive? And she said, my ass. And I said, okay, great. So let me block it so that every time you sing to Peron, you walk away from him. So he has no, po no other possibility but to look at your beautiful ass. And all of a sudden, this gave her the whole power to, uh, and energy to put that whole entire sensuality, that entire seduction scene in her backside. So that every time she walked away, her whole goal was to get him to be hypnotized by the way her hips moved so that she could eventually win him over. So this is kind of a beginning of how I work. I could go on and on, but let me pass it down to Sarah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Could, could I refine the question just a little bit? It'll make it a little bit more difficult. It's the same question, but uh, what we're getting is certainly an actor, a dancer must know oneself. You know yourself, yes? But we're born, we have personalities, and we develop the notes that work, that work for us very early. So we keep playing those notes over and over and over again. Uh, what about all those other reservoirs? What about those reservoirs that an actor or a dancer might not be familiar with, but you want that to come from the actor to the dancer? <laughs> you know, the actor to the, to the performance, rather. How do you deal with digging in and introducing a performer to those parts of him or herself that they don't know, but you know are there? Sarah. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite welcome. <laughs> um, well, I, I had a whole other sort of speech prepared here. My <laughs> it's my job. Create some chaos. Uh, shooting from the hip here entirely. Um, first, I do have to say something that um, is very similar to uh, what everyone is, is going to be saying and has said up to this point, which is that just as I have a speaking voice and you have a speaking voice, we all have our own movement voice. And, and whether you know it or not, you are an expert in that voice. But you may not know that you're an expert. So it's, how, it's getting you to understand how you become aware of that area of expertise that you have in your own body. It has to do with the memory synapses that you've lived through, which are now actually we've found to be on a cellular level, actually. Memory lives on a cellular level inside your body. So digging into those parts of you that you may not even um, be thinking of intellectually um, is really intrinsic to my process. And, and when I'm working, it really depends on who I'm working with. If I'm working with um, a pedestrian person who is a non-dancer, then I'm, and if that person comes from a marginalized community, for example, then I go into their story. What is their story? How has it felt to be who they are? And when they tell me their story or they embody their story, I look at the gestures that they make and the parts of their bodies that they use. Um, if I'm working with a professional dancer, um, then a lot of the time I give them tasks, movement tasks. I might give them a very simple phrase like, um, let's see, uh, I'm reaching for the moon, but I'm being pulled down by gravity. Um, or I'm, I want to fly, but gravity is pulling me back down to earth. How about that? And then I will, you know, we will investigate that from a movement perspective and then get into it from an intellectual and emotional perspective. How does that feel? What does that look like? Um, and, and how does that translate metaf from metaphor into real life? How does, that, how does that relate to your life as a human being? 
um, I think that we all have, you know, I write, I, I frequently write. I, I write a, a regular column called Screen Dance Diaries for an online magazine, magazine called Cultural Weekly that explores the intersections of dance and movement, but I also have written many scripts. And when I'm screenwriting, I, I think about the character and the kind of little windows of their movement that are, that are windows into their soul and windows into to their, their personalities. Like if somebody's very nervous, you might see them you know, constantly tapping their foot or you know, curling their fingers or brushing their, their hair back or you know, wetting their lips or rearranging their clothes. Close. Little Little, little idiosyncrasies that point to a person and how they feel about themselves. So when you're speaking to someone about their movement voice, I feel like it's really important to not just speak to them, but take notice and then be brave enough to sort of point them out, point out their idiosyncrasies. Um, and they have to be brave enough to go there with me. I, I hope that makes sense to you all, and I don't know whether I'm answering you your question. You did. That was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> David. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have both the luxury and the curse of working in a conservatory environment, which allows me a great deal of time to work with actors. So this is how I frame it for myself. Uh, initially, there's a period of time which is necessary to work pre-character. That is to say, to work on the actor's instrument before uh, the process of building character begins. And I think that corresponds exactly with what we've been hearing. Um, for me, the way I considered that process uh, or that period of time, the biggest challenge is to marry the inner life of the individual with the outer expressive form. And uh, that's actually a kind of a delicious quandary, which takes a lot of investigation and a lot of time to really um, work through. But the ultimate goal is to arrive at a place where uh, inner energies, including emotions and thoughts, are capable of being expressed externally with great fluidity and simplicity. So I would call that the pre-character phase. It takes a year. Um, uh, and after that, we can actually move to the building of character. So I would pick up on something that Jean-Louis said, which is a very important word to me, and that is the idea of a base. Each of us has a physical base, and each of us is an idiosyncratic character, right? None of us are neutral. Uh, so we're working away from the principle of neutrality towards some kind of a bias or, uh, or idiosyncrasy that is unique to the character. Now, uh, there are many ways of building this base. We, uh, John louis mentioned animal work, for example. Michael Chekhov's psychological gesture. Um, actually, observation is a perfectly legitimate way of uh, sort of borrowing a base from somebody else and beginning to embody it for yourself. And, uh, and I do think that what lies at the heart of the question of a new base, a base that is not my own but that belongs to a character, is the premise of an image. There's, there's no, it, it cannot be overestimated, this, the power and the... Um, uh, creative influence of imagery in the actor's process. So having, uh, having commenced with a kind of foundational base that belongs to the character, then I would look at uh, another layer, which would be external characteristics. Those would be the surface characteristics, tics, mannerisms, even costume, which pulls out uh, different qualities and different um, aspects of character. I really want to support Sarah's terminology because a voice and a body are one. Uh, one of the great uh, challenges that we certainly face in education, and I think it's true in all of our creative work, is that somewhere, somehow, somebody decided that voice is one thing and physical movement is another. It's just preposterous. So everything I'm saying about the body is uh, perfectly valid and integrated into the voice. There is the idiosyncratic voice. There's the base voice of the character, and there are the tics and the mannerisms of voice. Um, so I, thi I see it as a kind of three-layered process. First, first uh, uh, the pre-character work, then building a base, and then on top of that, the surface characteristics, which sometimes live 
in concert with that bass. That is to say, uh, let's say I use the tiger as my base for a character and I happen to be wearing velvety clothes and to be moving slinkily across the stage. Or sometimes they live in contrast to the base. So I might choose the tiger as my base, but wear very tight clothes, uh, and, you know, and tiny glasses and, uh, and a hat that I can't see through. Um, so there are differing ways of uh, either complementing or contrasting this layering process. That's, that's uh, my answer. You pass. <laughs> well done. Okay, so there's a, there, there, there's a common thread, certainly, and uh, yet different approaches. Uh, what, I, what, what I perceive is that, the, is, is that movement is not just external. Movement is internal. And movement is everything. We're talking about movement being voice. I look at you. I see your attention. Movement being that attention. The movement of emotion. The movement of intuition the movement of sensuality, the movement of memory. It seems to be everywhere. Now, what is, what, what is, what is interesting is the term building the character. It sounds so work-oriented. <laughs> uh, it sounds so, you know. What about the idea of meeting the character, of the character coming to you, of revealing the character? So I'd like to think again uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, we all have an inner life, and we all have an outer life. And I guess the only thing that's ever interested me in the world, the only thing, is the relationship between the inner and the outer life. What is the harmony? What is the conflict? What is the negotiation? None of you are saints, so they're all somewhat different, right? So that's an interesting prospect, it's just to go a little bit further in terms of what, how do you take an actor? How can you take an actor to the inner life particularly reservoirs that they don't necessarily know about yet, the unknown, because every actor wants to go into the unknown, I hope. That's what's exciting, <laughs> right, isn't it? Um, and how do you work both on the inner life and the outer life so that the accidents of movement might occur? Those movements that are not gestures, those movements that are not conscious. Sarah. <laughs> I know, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm working on three proposals right now and I came with no notes whatsoever, <laughs> so I feel about this big. Um, the last part of that question, one more time, please repeat the that. The question was, how do you, how do you how do you create the world where the, uh, with, with, with an actor or a dancer where the inner life and the outer life are both in play in that? I mean, often we go to a dance and all we see is the choreography, all we see is the outer life. We see great dance and we experience something else, like a bit of Bausch. How do you find that? Well, again, it really depends on the person I'm working with and the form I'm working in. If I'm creating a dance work, I myself personally am really interested in the line between dancing and walking and um, seeing the real life in the dance. I want to live my, dance my life and live my dance, so to speak. So if I'm working with a dancer, I really look for moments where there are idiosyncratic gestures that are built into the choreography, but that they happen in a way that seems um, chosen by the dancer mm -hmm. and not um, orchestrated or instituted by me. So I, I have to lead them to find that. And that's always different depending on the individual that I'm working with. Um, a lot of times I use very idiosyncratic movements in my dances. You know, I, I, like I, might, I might do something like this or, or like, like that. Or you know, I use my hands a lot in my in my works um, because I feel like they speak just as we use our hands speaking. Sorry, um, I, you know I've seen more and more. You see people on this on the phone on the cell phones, and they're you know they're completely in their own bubble, but they're using their hands while they speak to somebody. And that person can't see them whatsoever. But I wish that I could hold up a window, you know, a mirror to them so that they could see the way that they were moving 
and then become more self-aware. Um, I'm not quite sure where I was going with that, but I think, that, again, we all have idiosyncrasies. I think when I was recently working with an actress who asked me to help her prepare for an audition, and in that audition she was um, a dancer. She was supposed to be an, um, an aging dancer who was recalling her more youthful dance years. And since, again, a large part of that was her memories, I had to have her, I, I asked her to tell the story in a way with less movement. Um, and find and just feel the way it was, and she was a former dancer, to imagine herself as that former dancer. And she would start to move in certain ways in recalling that. And then we took those movements, I pointed them out to her, I asked her to, you know, make them larger, which for a stage, and in particular, you have to have that happen. Um, and I explored them, and I integrated them with the choreography that we um, came up with, which was a mixture of blocking, as any actor would do in a scene, and actual movement that she was recalling. But that movement was coming from memory. It was not coming from, I did a step and it looked like this. It was coming from her recollections, if that makes sense. It does. Can I try this one? I, th I think you asked two questions. I think you asked, on the one hand, uh, how does the actor enter the unknown um, in relation to their physical life? For me, that's about the pre-character phase in which one's uh, repressed energies are released through this journey of marrying inner and outer life. So if we carry through our uh, memory or experience uh, tremendous anger, tremendous joy, uh, trauma, um, liberation, whatever it might be. Typically, uh, because we live in society and we have to behave, uh, we're not familiar with uh, fully expressing the potential energies uh, in our own experience. So for me, the unknown is not so much about uh, something that is outside of the individual. The unknown actually lives within. It's like you have a library of experience inside you, but you've locked various rooms because they're not actually permissible uh, in, our, in our kind of uh, mutually agreed social interactions. So, so opening those doors uh, and exploring what it means to fully express those uh, uh, hidden parts of ourselves gets us in touch with the unknown. Then I heard you ask a second question, which is about the relationship between the inner and the outer life. And for me, uh, I'll give you my answer through the lens of Ibsen, uh, with whom I am fascinated and about whom I am deeply passionate, especially Hedda Gabler. So Ibsen has a particular genius for creating characters whose inner and outer lives are in complete opposition with each other. And if you know Hedda, then I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, Loveborg, the tormented, uh, demonic character that he created, uh, in my subjective opinion, wishes to ascend and deify himself into a kind of a celestial being. That's his inner urge, to transform into a god. You can already start to kind of uh, build imagery around that notion, even as I'm describing it. But his, his physical life is utterly dissolute. He's a drunk, he's a whoremonger, and, and to put it casually, he's a complete mess. So Ibsen has built all the solutions into that dynamic, that dynamic between the inner life in which the yearning is for one thing, and the outer form in which the physical experience is something absolutely contrasting. He does it with Mrs. Elfsted, whose outer life is very mousy and quiet, but whose inner life is revolutionary. He does it with Hedda, whose inner life is yearning for freedom and escape, and whose outer life is, uh, uh, is kind of um, defined by her loathing for her own body and her inability to access physical freedom, and so on and on. You could kind of build your way through the whole play uh, based on this, this principle of the conflict between inner and outer. So I do think that when we're talking about the inner life, we are actually uh, discussing psychophysical um, experiences and definitions of the character or the person. When we're talking about the outer life, we're expressing or uh, well we're uh, um, addressing form. 
And I think that's a, an absolutely delicious uh, kind of counterpoint to explore. It is indeed. It's fascinating. It's a, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but we used to hear that uh, in England or in schools, in, in England one worked very much from the outer. Right? Well, I think in dance as well. And quite often in New York, with what happened, we work from the inner. Now, is it possible that movement is explored <laughs> through both? I mean, it's great seeing an actor work through an inner, but sometimes it can be very indulgent movement. And it's okay, it's wonderful to see a person do a wonderful physical outer experience, but it's not believable. How do we find that? How do we create the work where both we are working with the movement on the inside, and it transforms us to something that is unrecognizable, which is still very believable. I hope that's not too convoluted a question. Jean-Louis? No, uh, uh, everything that's been said just by you two, absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm learning a lot. The extraordinary thing that Alexander found is that our body is, is, is the link to our lives. So when you're thinking about inner life, outer life, we're, we are living in the middle. For me is, I love the idea of being on the edge. And what, what that means is, <clears throat> and it deals with what you said before, some people try really hard to put on a mask or harden themselves or make themselves very beautiful. If you sometimes, being very beautiful can be an incredible mask, especially in this town. <laughs> and um, you can do it by bodybuilding, you can do it by uh, beautifying, you can do it by putting beautiful clothes, you can do it by moving in a s special way. And you think that you are protecting yourself, but you're not. When people really look at you and really meet you, they actually see you as you are. And they can actually see the artifice. Uh, what uh, David was saying about, um, about the play, about these characters that are doing sometimes the opposite, and that means that that's the skill that you have to practice every day within your body. Your body is the bridge between your inner and outer life all the time. But the tricky thing is, I'm thinking about um, The Remains of the Day. Has anyone seen it? The movie Anthony Hopkins? So th there's a great deal of pain and emotion and, and what the character does when his father dies, he is, he is withholding, actively withholding. And all that he can do when, uh, t is to touch his father with one finger. So that tells you that that character is very uh, actively repressed. And that's a, something that you need to practice. Um, there's some actors that are really good uh, at this. Um, Judy Dench is the master of, uh, of it. And they know how less is more, uh, is, is more than, you know, than doing too much in, in your body, less. And, but your body is the bridge. So in Alexander, we have something called inhibition. And most people, when I use the word inhibition, you think of Freudian inhibition, right? Something that's getting in the way. Well, what Alexander meant was for you to stop everything, stop doing so much, stop activating your masking, the thing that gets in between us, in between people, and have the courage to be yourself and to reveal something that is going on inside directly in the event. It's very tricky because you said it, layering. In the, uh, the artist knows how to layer this. And in painting, you see it, the, the really good painters, they can actually layer pa uh, paints in such a way that three dimension comes in. Uh, you see uh, even muscular tension through the paint 
just insane. But the masters know how to do that. And that is the delicious part of being an actor. And for me, that is the delicious part of building or discovering the character. Uh, actually, discovering the characters is better than building. Um, I don't know why. I agree. <laughs> To say for that's now. all you have to say. That's okay. I'm that's very right. great. Okay, we were we were really quite quite sort of memorized there, uh, Vincent. Yes. Now, as a choreographer, um, as a choreographer, particularly, uh, and I love your work. I mean, when I saw da Dancer in the Dark, I thought, oh my goodness, finally, someone <laughs> dance is happening here. It's not saying what the narrative says. It takes us somewhere else. It actually took us to the inner experience of that, of that human being. And I very much admired that. So often one doesn't see it. One might see dance as yet another uh, way of enforcing what we already know. So tell us a little bit about that process and perhaps how the inner movement might reveal itself as an accident in a good way? Well, um, I, I will kind of answer that question, but I, 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 I think that, it's, that this panel is more about the actor rather than the dancer and the choreographer, you know. So uh, I, I think that, um, you know, in terms of how I choreograph for someone, uh, who's not necessarily a dancer, is I ask them to improvise a little bit with me and I kind of see what their body language is and then I riff off of that and try to find something that I think will make them look good and make them feel comfortable and will make the movement uniquely their own. Um, but when I work as a director, what I do, I don't have the luxury of all of this playtime that it seems that these guys get to have and boy I wish I did but you know and and this term the unknown is something that I steer away from because everything that I try to do is get the actor to get back to the known uh, expose what they really know and are perhaps afraid uh, of revealing or think that it's inappropriate to reveal because they think this idea of what their character is and I keep saying there is no other character it's you you are the character, you are the part. So what I do, perhaps because I'm a choreographer, is I block every single movement from the first word of a play to the end of a play. Because as a choreographer, and, and having been an actor and a director, I know as a choreographer instinctually exactly what the body would do. So what I do is, as a, a, a writer creates the, the words, as the composer and lyricist create the music, I create the blocking, which is the choreography for the entire show. And then what I do, once the actor learns that specifically, which I think at the beginning of any piece that you create, the director knows more about the character than you do. As we go through it, I say, okay, now if something feels different or uncomfortable for you, then we'll change it. Um, I create the sketch, I create the outline, and I have the actor go through that a couple times. And then I say, all right, now, let's take this situation and how would you do this? And I'm gonna go, again, specific examples. Uh, I will go back to Evita again. This, there's a scene where Eva Perón has just met Juan Perón and she's going to go into his bedroom and confront his young mistress. Every time I had seen Evita prior to what I tried to do, uh, the, char the actress that plays Evita goes in the room, screams at this young woman, and tries to chase her out of the room like a vicious harpy. And this is what my actress did as well. And I said to her, okay, I'm going to go back to, as I re mentioned to you at the beginning, these are the es essential points that every actor has to look at in every single scene. Primarily, what is your objective, and how can you win? So in this situation, here's Eva Peron, and she is trying to move up in the world because she believes in the working class, because she believes in the poor, and she believes that it's important that, they, that their position rises in the world. So in this room, this young mistress is one of the working poor. So by an actress walking into that room and screaming at this girl to get the hell out of there, she's totally defeating the whole point of what this character is trying to, to, to manifest and to win. So I said to my actress, okay, so this is the idea. You walk in, I gave her the blocking, you have to get this girl out of the room because you're gonna take over. And now how would you 
what would you do in this situation as a woman in this predicament? Um, let's explore your personal physicality. What would you do? What would you do first as a woman when you walked into a room and you want to know about your potential future lover husband? So she walked into the room the first time and she didn't really pay any attention at all. She just kind of looked at the woman on the bed, sat down in the chair and kind of demanded that she leave. I said, I don't believe you. Take your time, slow down, be yourself, how would you treat this woman? What do you want from her? Do you want her to dislike you? No. I want her to like me. Why do you want her to like me? Because she's of the working class and these are the people that I'm trying to give power to. Okay, so if you kick her out of the room, you know that she's going to go out and your street cred is going to drop completely, right? So how would you make her feel okay and kick her out of the room. So she walks into the room now, what she does, the very first thing she did, which I thought was ingenious as a woman, she put her fingers and checked how much dust was on the dressing table. Because she said, as a woman, I wanna see how this future husband of mine lives. I wanna see how this mistress is taking care of him. Then the next thing she did is rather than stand there and complain to the mistress, she took the clothes and started helping her pack her bags. So she was being kind to this woman. So at the same time that she's getting her to go, she's letting her know that she could be in this position or she was in this position at another time. And the final thing that she did, she had a mink stole on. I said, why don't you do something with that mink stole? As a woman, what would you do? I said, do you want her to go out there? Do you want her to go out there and diss you the minute she walks out in the street? Absolutely not, she says. So think about yourself in this situation. What would she do? So the final thing that she did is she took her stole off and she put it around the mistress as she walked her out of the room. So these are the things that I keep trying to dig into. I, I set the primary movement, and then I ask you to not step into the unknown, but to step back into the known. Who are you, and how would you physically act in this situation? And the same questions that we ask ourselves as an actor are the same, again, questions that we ask ourselves in real life. How do we work when we're in a situation, when we're in a situation of confrontation, when we're in a situation of seduction, when we're in a situation where we feel less than, when we're in a situation where we have the power, how do we physically manifest that? And so rather than, because I don't have the time to explore all of these things in the directing situations that I have, I take these moments and I keep guiding the actor to going back to who they are and how they specifically work physically in all of these situations, predominantly to win in every scene. Thank you. <laughs> these guys are so polite. They are, aren't they, really? So you're very polite. What's the matter with you? Uh, where is your chaos, <laughs> right? <laughs> Movement is also chaos. Um, interesting, okay, so what's being brought up is the word blocking on several occasions. Uh, and the difference between dance and theater. I guess that's the case. I guess. There must be a lot of similarities as well. So let me ask David and Sarah to respond to this, the, the, the question of blocking, which is another very concrete word, isn't it? Blocking. I know as a director, if I work with an actor for three actors for three weeks because I have to get a show on, it's very, very hard. But do we force actors into blocking or choreographer? choreography, or do we find something that is revealed in them? I know when an actor walks into the room, I like to look at what side do they prefer to have a person on, right? David is very different for me on this side than he will be to my right side, yes? Or is the actor the future or the past? Or what is going on in their heads? Or do they love being close? Or they love, I try to sort that out very, very quickly so I can make them uncomfortable. I do, right? Uh, so, what do you take into consideration in term, David, in terms of uh, when you're, you're directing a play, you've got to get it on, in terms of blocking, in terms of shape, space, texture? Um, I try to start with a simple premise, which is that the dynamics between people uh, consist of a pull or a push, a towards or an away. 
And in the very early stages of a rehearsal period, uh, what I will attempt to explore with the actors is whether a given moment, a line of text, or a, a given circumstance uh, prompts the actor to, or the character, I should say, to move towards their scene partner or partners or move away from them. This is an abstract exercise. At this stage, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether we're in a living room or on a blasted heath or, um, uh, or at the bottom of the ocean. Rather, we're just exploring the physical dynamics. And uh, strangely enough, I've learned that over time, what begins abstractly begin, uh, starts to develop towards um, a recognizable interaction. Uh, towards and away can first be represented through physical steps. I travel towards you, you travel towards me, or we go away from each other. Later, subtleties can be introduced. I can move towards you simply with a kind of shift of my weight, or I can move away from you just by considering that I'm moving away from you. So there are different ways of playing that scale. But I've learned that uh, it's possible to actually um, evolve the staging of a scene. Try not to use the word blocking because of all that it represents. Um, but I, uh, it's possible to evolve the staging of the scene simply by uh, continually practicing and exploring these uh, simple dynamics of uh, do I go towards you or do I go away from you? Uh, I'll just answer with that. Sarah? Well, again, I think it has to do, the way I would answer that would have to do with what, whether you were working in film or on theater. Because there's a completely different depth of field and the way of perceiving it with one, you know, one or the other. Um, if I'm, uh, you know, working on a stage production, be it a dance or, or working um, as a choreographer for, for a director who's doing a stage production, which I have done many times, um, I'm going to approach it based on the way the stage is, to a certain amount, um, the production design that, I that is existing on the stage. And where the, a uh, the director has have is asking the actors to stand to begin with to deliver their lines. And then I will s make suggestions based on what I think may be missing in terms of emotion. Um, if I'm working in film, uh, then I have my eyes are not even on what is happening in you know live in the ca in front of the camera. I'm my eyes are at Video Village. I'm living at Video Village and looking in the image of the camera because that is the truth. And the depth of field is based entirely on the shot and um, the way the director is is seeing it in that moment and in that area in that arena. Um, what what may work one moment may not work the next. For example, um, a few years ago, I I did uh, a film for JJ with JJ Abrams called um, Star Trek Into Darkness, and for two weeks I worked with um, about twenty five men who basically had to go through a minimum of six or eight hours a day of this horrible makeup. But before that time, we worked on creating a new species, this red planet species. So it was an unknown, and I, w I wasn't giving a given any parameters. We were just sort of supposed to invent a species. So I worked with them on um, um, what, you know, how, what, is, what are the characteristics of how we walk? When we walk across a room, where are we moving from, and what are we going to? And you know, most people move with their feet, and their body falls a little bit behind, or they're thinking if they're very arrogant, they may be moving from their chest, or you know. And we explore different ways of moving across the room, and I gave them different exercises. And a lot of them, most of them, were not dancers, and a lot of them were um, experts in the field of you know what is it called? Uh, I've forgotten. Uh, pardon? No, <laughs> um, the, you know, they were used to f diving off buildings and stuntmen, stunt stunt they were stuntmen and, stunt and <laughs> thank you. And, and they were not used to, um, you know, a skinny woman telling them, you know, move across <laughs> the room as if, as if it's, you know, I would say things like, let's pretend the entire room is filled with water 
and that you can breathe underwater. And I want you to move from here to there, and the camera is over here. And I want you to, along the way, find a way of falling and beckoning to the person behind you to come in your wake and getting back up and continuing. You know, and what is, the, what is, what is it, what does the weight of the water feel like on your body and through your fingers and through your hair? And maybe, maybe we're not moving like normal people and maybe we are moving from our heads first, for example. Um, and maybe instead of the way our eyebrows and our hands sort of work um, as sort of um, punctuation to expressive vocal movement, maybe um, we have fingers sort of moving almost like tentacles. <laughs> I mean, I just imagined all kinds of things and they went with me to explore these things. Then we went, you know, we were moved to set. We, we did this for two weeks, and we were moved to set where there was a whole series of obstacles on this red planet that was created beautifully, I might add, with rocks and trees and so forth that they had to then, little did I know beforehand, jump over or move through. And it all, and, you know, my obsession became entirely with the angle that the camera was seeing things at and where are the spaces that were left empty. And also that they not look like um, jocks when they jumped and they landed. That they looked more like a gazelle or something, if that's even possible. Just more animal. And we worked a lot with animal exercises for that. But again, I think, you know, it really intends entirely, it's dependent entirely on um, where, where it's happening. Exactly, and th thank you. Uh, and what strikes me is, is, is you're really talking about the greatest tool we have, which is our imagination, which is allowing, allowing people to imagine they were going through water. I had a terrible time, I wish I thought of water. I did a, uh, directed an all-female version of the Iliad with Catalan actors, with a translator, and I said, I want you to do this scene as if you're going through a snowstorm. And it was terrible. <laughs> No, no, through a snowstorm. And it was translated to Spanish, it was translated to Canada. It was terrible. Of course, they were from Spain. They had no idea what a snowstorm was. <laughs> you know how much I give it a go, right? Um, the other thing that's of interest is, uh, well, there's many things of, uh, of interest. You, you've you referred to the difference between film and stage, just as the difference between dance and theater, right? There are differences. But I seem to sometimes think that we forget about the similarities. First of all, let's say, you know, if I'll, I'll ask you, to, you gentlemen, to, uh, actors have often come to me and say, well, this is, uh, I'm, I'm gonna learn how to act for stage, and I'm gonna learn how to act for film, right? Very compartmentalized, which superstore I'm gonna go to for which product. Uh, I've actually had an LA actor say, well, you know, you think differently in film than you do on stage. And I said, pardon me? Well, the thought process, it has to be quicker. The, uh, pardon me? I mean, you can, you know, bullshit detectors can tell when a thought process is real or not, and that's what your audience is, right? So, but there are differences. In terms of movement, um, perhaps, Vincent, you could talk about what, did, what do you consider the differences? You've, you've talked about, about choreography, of movement for an actor who's in a film and an actor who is on a stage. On a stage. Me? Yes, indeed. Well, I don't feel that there is a difference, right. honestly. I feel that it's the same, and I feel that it all comes from the emotion because I feel that as human beings that our bodies react to how we feel emotionally and how we are in every emotional situation. Uh, it, that's just humanity, and I try to, uh, whenever I've choreographed, I try to create story by getting the, uh, the dancers to understand where they're coming from and what they're feeling. So if I'm creating a abs semi-abstract piece, it never feels abstract because it always has some story behind it, some emotional truth behind it, so that the physicality then, then can then translate to the audience and they don't feel like they're just looking at some amazing physical athletes who can do things that they could never imagine executing themselves. I try to create movement that 
we all can, as pedestrians, identify with and feel that uh, if you sort of uh, go back to the Fred Astaire days, I think what made Fred Astaire such an incredible uh, 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 character loved by so many was he made movement seem so simple that even though people couldn't do it, they felt that he was so natural in his movement, so honest in his movement, that you felt that you could identify with him because you felt like you possibly, after watching his movie, could get up and do the same thing, you know? <laughs> so. This is what I mean, you know, when you come from story, when you come from emotion, um, this is where I think the truth of physicality lies, whether you're creating uh, an abstract character or whether you're creating a very honest down-to-earth character, abstract character, I'm talking about the kind of character that that's, uh, Sarah was just discussing. But, you know, I'll tell you, I am so jealous listening to these three because, I, uh, in fact, I'd like to be in these workshops and, s and classes because I never get the opportunity to do this, you know. I never get the opportunity to take an actor and have a week to explore something and do improvisations and things like this. So I'm forced to kind of, again, I repeat, uh, I'm sorry to keep repeating this, but to keep pushing them back to going inside, knowing themselves, knowing how they physically act and respond to any emotional situation. And again, I think that the way you have to do that as an actor is either get into a dance class, get to understand your body, or take a Pilates class, or an Alexander class, or yoga class, or anything where you stop thinking about yourself as just this thing that's hidden behind your eyes, but this force that is this three-dimensional being that we've been granted, and that's where you'll get your power. Thank you. Good. Uh, we're, 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 we're gradually, we're getting to the time where we're going to take some questions. Uh, but do you want to respond to I just to want to sure. say, say one really quick Absolutely. thing that has, is niggling at me. I think that um, one thing that, that I think Jean-Louis has sort of, sort of abstractly referred to, but um, that we haven't talked about is, is trust. And when you're working with an actor, you have to create an arena of trust. And, you know, I, or if I'm working with 25 stuntmen, I have to, you know, create an arena of trust because God knows they do not want to look s stupid or silly or, you know, they're, they're afraid of looking like jerks. Um, so, and, w and I think that one way that we do that as human beings is, is um, not try to disguise our own fallibilities and just be an honest, imperfect human being with, you know, in front of another person. And that tacitly gives permission for another person to relax. Absolutely. Thank you. And quick, very quick questions. Okay. Um, Jean-Louis, is it possible for an actor to live truthfully in every given moment and yet transform to the unrecognizable? <laughs> That's an easy question. These are, these are quick, 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 quick questions and quick answers. The, um, I would go and, 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 and double with uh, Vincent here. Um, I think the greatest treasure that you all have is your story inside and, and, and flaws. I think flaws are really interesting. And, and a lot of actors try to get perfect. And the most interesting, I think that the best actors are the ones that have accepted themselves and they use their, their flaws to their own advantage. So they all seem that they, they are telling the truth. Um, and, and physically, that, uh, the body loved you to be yourself. Um, Great, thank you. David, yeah. yeah I, ask you I, I, I love yeah. that question. The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, some of my uh, character exercises include challenges to my students to actually come to class so unrecognizable that I will not know who they are, um, which is a spectacular exercise. And if you repeat it over time, week after week, then uh, it really pushes the actor to explore um, imagery that is completely different for them. Uh, but if you think of Gary Oldman, or if you look at Christian Bale, or you know even some comedians, uh, Steve Coogan is a wonderful example. 
these are actors that are capable of being genuinely unrecognizable. There's a little-known Steve Coogan series, um, so little-known that I forget its name, but uh, in, the, in the pilot episode, he appeared as a character. I saw it in the credits at the end of the show, so-and-so played by Steve Coogan. And I thought, wait a second, Steve Coogan was the lead in this show, and I was following his story. And I had to rewind it and get to the part where, and lo and behold, he played opposite himself, you know, using camera trickery. And he was just staggering, absolutely staggering, both in externally and internally, so different that it completely went over my head. And that kind of thing is thrilling. It is extraordinary. Yeah. It is an extraordinary accomplishment. And sometimes it's a lifetime journey. With mean, the, the, the man that I worked with, Yat, the drama center training people like Colin Firth, uh, Anthony Hopkins, some of the fighters, and it is a lifetime. They still carry their notes with them, right? Uh, I just finished by saying Michael Chekhov, the great acting pedagogue, uh, once said, and I'll never forget this because it's just so brilliant and evocative, every actor, consciously or unconsciously, longs for transformation. Indeed, yes. And that is extraordinary when we see it. And sometimes that involves the most wonderful accidents. Okay, we're going to go to you. I'm going to just pick up this first question. Okay, we have a question from Brandon. Uh, what is a performance that comes to mind when talking about great physicality in film or TV? I think I've said one, but where we go? A performance. What is a performance? A performance that comes to mind that has great physicality could be in film, TV. Why won't? Yeah, so that's the question. I'll go to the Anthony Hopkins fan club, um, <laughs> and I love Remains of the Day, but uh, I just want to choose one moment, not a performance, but a specific moment in Howard's End, uh, which is a spectacularly risky piece of acting, I thought. Uh, I don't know if you know Howard's End, but it starred Hopkins and Emma Thompson, and it's a very British, very repressed story based on E.M. Forster. <laughs> And everyone's buttoned up. It's similar to Remains of the Day in that respect. There's one moment when Emma Thompson and Anthony Hopkins' characters are outside, and she's telling him something that he doesn't want to hear. And out of nowhere, if, if you're Emma Thompson, Hopkins suddenly goes like that. Uh, it's a terribly melodramatic gesture. Somehow, it works. And uh, I find that to be an inspirational moment that I will... Always remember. Is it a subconscious or is it a conscious gesture? I, I think it's a manifestation of his subconscious and he dared to actually uh, express it physically and uh, it's very striking. Yes. Okay, uh, here's a question from Robert. Uh, any member of the panel, all right? Is there just one thing to remember, one thing to remember in order to make your character come alive? And what is it? Way we go. <laughs> If you had to answer that question, can you answer that question? I'll, I'll give it a try, I'll give it a try. Lovely. Um, the biggest thing for me is your breath. Uh, I find that unless I can actually can, uh, hear the breath happening freely, the performance is not gonna happen. And it doesn't matter how talented the actor, I've worked with actors that are so talented and wonderful, but the breathing wasn't there. It, it, it was amazing. So the breath is that thing that's inside all of us and that, and that often gets ignored. And um, I want you to work on it, everybody, including myself, <laughs> I still am. And uh, I was, were you finished? Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, trying to connect emotionally to the character. What can you find in the character that is similar to the way you feel in certain situations? Because once you find that, then you don't have to put the character on you, you can step into the character. And because you are stepping into the character, you will bring your own physicality to it. So I, I, again, I say you try to connect with the emotional through line or the emotional moments that happen in every situation. I like the question from Ray Gestout, if the, or the implication of the question. The question is, when you come to the most effective interpretation or expression of a moment that you could conceive of, do you set that behavior and do it over and over again? Or do you let it go and try to stay spontaneous? And how do you let it go? So I think the question is, 
Do you keep repeating the same thing, or do you enter the process of reinventing and reinventing so that you find the same thing spontane spontaneously through performance? David? I would say know your territory. That is to say, if you're uh, in a Greek tragedy, which is heavily gestural, or if you're working in Commedia dell'arte, which is uh, also heavily archetypical, then yes, actually, you are in obligated to refulfill that gestural language, performance after performance, and find ways of making it original and fresh. But of course, if you're in uh, working in realism or naturalism, then there is a little bit more space and wiggle room. Uh, I think so, yeah. Mark Rylance, um, uh, to use another uh, example, is famous for uh, not staging his productions, at least uh, on occasion. He, uh, he'll go through an entire play and he will refuse to stage it in any way, uh, so that everything is brand new to everybody every moment, every night. Um, so, yeah, there are different ways of looking at it, but I would say uh, know your territory. I don't think the question is change the move, uh, but how do you explore it so the move has never happened before ever anywhere and uh, you can trust that process. Okay, let's go to another question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's well, a question, think, here's no, a question. I, 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 I'll you want to take say a little something? bit of an Good. answer to that. I think that uh, if you're not doing something like Commedia dell'arte or Greek tragedy where the uh, choreography that you have is so specific and you have to fulfill it, uh, yet you are still given blocking and I use that word as a good word, sorry, but as a choreographer, I sort of, again, as I say, I see blocking as a, as a music or as a lyricist composed lyrics or as a composer composes music. So perhaps that's because I come from the world of choreography as well. But I, I think that you have to keep increasing your stakes uh, and your obstacles because if you have to continue to do the same blocking night after night, even though you might have a little wiggle room here and there, you can't keep coming and doing it exactly the same all the time. Although, I have to say, Shirley MacLaine always did, and she always made it seem whether she, she would move a finger the same exact way every time she would do a scene. Uh, I've worked with her often, and it always felt actual. And she said to, I said to her, how do you do that? And she said, well, I keep increasing the stakes. I keep thinking I'm going to lose, so I have to find new ways internally to up my ante uh, because this is what the director gave me and this is what I have to do. So that's what I feel is one approach, is that you have to keep changing your obstacles. You have to keep in changing and increasing your stakes. Great, thank you. And by the way, it's not that I object to the word blocking. It just it always feels like a dead end, and I think movement never stops. I think movement has no straight lines. I think it is always circular and figure eights. And quite often we stop at our blocking and we're dead. What about our mind moving? It's just a psychological thing, but let's still go with the word blocking. <laughs> okay, all right, here's one, okay. Very simple, what is your favorite exercise? What's your favorite exercise, I guess, for movement that you'd like to share? I like to say mine. I'm not on the panel, but I swing. I swing. I have actors swing for 20 minutes to 30 minutes before I even start. To f if our physical life is a response of our inner life, certainly we can create a physical life to free the emotions, to free us so that we're not occupied by space, that we occupy space, that our emotions are not arrested but are fluid, that our mind is functioning, that it all goes, and I find swinging is a wonderful way to enter a rehearsal. Uh, I'll answer. My favorite is I find the balance in my feet. I think feet are uh, the most important things and I work on t taking my weight forwards and backwards as I'm going up and finding your balance on your feet is very difficult. You know, and uh, most people take it for, for granted, but that's the first thing that, that's the first step that the character walking in. Where's your balance? How are you balancing? Are you going all in one foot or the other foot? Are you holding your chest? Are you holding your neck? Are you holding your hips? I find it really humbling, a very humbling experience, and I um, uh, inspire you to play with balancing. 
Anyway. Uh, I always give a warm up. So I always give a class of some kind, depending on the uh, expertise of the people that I'm working with and uh, how physically uh, uh, able they are to to um, to do the exercises that I give them. But I totally agree with you. Every class that I start, and it might only be a half an hour, it might be 20 minutes, depending on what I have. But the very first thing I do is I ask the actor and the dancer to stand in place, close their eyes, stand in what's called a simple first position, uh, open simple open first position like this. And I ask them to close their eyes and actually feel the soles of their feet either in the shoe or on the floor, and so that they realize that they are attached to the earth. Because I believe so much of what we get, the energy comes from the earth and comes through us. So I'm totally with you in terms of the feet. I really think that once we start with recognizing where we are, and that's our grounding power spot, uh, we start from there and then everything moves. And I do a lot of swinging as well. I do a lot of movement. I do a lot of be a gorilla, you know, do this and really kind of to loosen the body up, to loosen the body up. And to create releases, yes, Sarah. Um, I was going to say something very similar to Vincent, no surprise there. Um, I start with a quick warm up, depending on the amount of time I have. And the first thing I do is have a, a, the dancer or the actor stand in first position and frequently close their eyes and then just circle with their arms down, of course. And then, you know, go and concentrate on their breath and sinking into their feet, but at the same time feeling um, their energy expanding to the, si to the top of the ceiling and the sides of the room. And in that circle, explore all those areas around them and the people around them until finally they settle into a center. And then I go into isolations. And then my favorite, you know, finding all the different ways that we can move, re move each part of our body, even our hands and our fingers, our eyes, our, you know, our mouths, um, and our heads and our necks, et cetera, and all the way down. And then I, my favorite exercise is actually moving through water and imagining you can breathe because in the end, gravity is what claims us and brings us back down to Earth. So it's a really good tool to use that and pay attention to it. Um, David, here's a question from um, Brendan. Very simple, good question. How can theater, how can a theater background, Brendan is obviously a theater training, theater background, how can that positively impact on the actor's on-screen work? Uh, I, would, I, I would just turn the question around. Without a theatrical background in terms of training, uh, what is it that one has to access? Um, and it's, it's a little bit difficult because it goes back to the question of, you know, what's the difference between stage and film, to which I think we probably all agree there isn't one. Uh, so for me, the training of the physical actor is relevant to any discipline. Um, and it has to be a full body training in which uh, all every aspect of the inner and outer life is stretched and flexed to its maximum. So I would actually approach the physical training for the actor the same, regardless of the medium in which they're working. Okay, I'm gonna just put my hands here and see what, what I draw out as a question. All right, okay, uh, here's one. Melanie, <laughs> for everyone, what's the biggest movement character challenge you faced and how did you meet it? Okay, I, I have a good one. Good. Uh, several years ago, I was hired by Ang Lee to develop the tiger movement for Life of Pi. And, um, and f on one end, it was easy for me, and on one end, it was the hardest thing because of the difficulties of the film. Basically, I had to put all the movement and decide on all the movement and write it down in the script. Everything was written down because it was so technical that uh, um, Ang wanted just to do it himself. So you develop it, you write it um, with the writer, and you move it. And actually, Ang Lee, uh, 
can you hold, um, I should do it here. He actually got on the floor and did all the movement of the tiger himself. It was remarkable. I had never experienced anything like that. And I learned a lot. And I wanted to be on set with, but he said, no, 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 I, uh, it's for me. <laughs> you do it, I want to learn everything you know, and I'll, I'll take it on the film, he did. And the result, you can see it on film. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, here's a question. I think it's a great, maybe final question. Um, the question is, what is the performance? What is the performance from theater, television, film? Let's include dance, do you mind, Nathan? That you think was particularly brilliant? What was the most brilliant performance that you saw? Or let me rephrase it, that inspired you? I'll go with the um, gentleman who performed in Georgia, Australia as the servant of two masters for 50 years, um, who by the time I saw that production was 77 years old. Did you see it, Jean-Louis? It was at UCLA Live. Oh my God, yes. You remember Not that guy? Only that, uh, yeah. Yeah, and there were tumbles and cartwheels. He was playing an Arlecchino, a Truffaldino is the name of the character, but it's an Arlecchino Ferruccio, architect. Ferruccio, that's saying. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, because it's a masked character, I read in the program that he'd been playing it for 50 years, but you didn't really understand exactly what you were witnessing until the curtain call, uh, at which moment the director, uh, actually who was long deceased, but had uh, nevertheless instructed his actors to remove their masks. And then you witness the face and the exhaustion on that face of a 77-year-old man uh, who had just been tumbling and cartwheeling through three hours of Goldoni. That was memorable. And listen to this, this is so strange and wonderful. I lived in Milano, and I, uh, the theater he's mentioned is Piccolo Teatro di Milano, and I grew up there, and that was the thing, that play inspired me to be an actor. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? That wow. same actor. <laughs> crazy. The performance that most inspired me was the first time I saw Pina Bausch in, um, in Wuppertal doing a piece called Comptan Smit Mir. And the lead, um, the lead uh, male was not a dancer at all. He was about five foot three and he was sort of stocky and he was a Schauspieler, an actor. And, um, and the lead dancer, a female dancer, was a woman who totally defied all n American norms for uh, someone who's classically trained. She was probably about 240 pounds. She had folds of flesh um, visible between, uh, underneath her very see-through um, slip, as was Pina's want to dress her women in. Um, and she moved like butter. And and she was incredible. She was absolutely incredible, and she was fearless. And the, um, I had no idea until the performance ended three hours later without an intermission, I might add, um, that, the, that, the, that the lead male actor was not a dancer at all um, because he never let that get in his way. And he was surrounded by incredible you know, uh, uh, there were 20 other incredibly beautiful male and female dancers climbing on walls and doing amazing choreography in unison. But you never noticed until afterwards that he wasn't a dancer. And I don't quite know how he did it, but he did. Um, as a, uh, in the acting world, I find that almost everything I see from Glenn Close inspires me. Tremendously. Uh, I can remember one moment in the Klaus von Bülow story where she's uh, in the scene in the dining room and she's trying to be strong and she's absolutely drunk. And she gets up and as she walks out of the room, she bangs into the door jam. And just those kinds of honest moments just give me orgasms. But um, in terms of dance, uh, I've had the great opportunity to work with some of the best in the world. However, before I started dancing, the first uh, dance concert that I ever saw was uh, Alvin Ailey. And I was uh, privileged enough to see Judith Jameson perform a piece called Cry. 
and I couldn't believe that this woman, who was a very strong, big-boned woman, could dance in a way that sometimes made her look like a feather and sometimes made her look like a rock. And it inspired me to dance. So. That's wonderful. <clears throat> The last question I've got written here, it sounds like we have a room time for one more question, hmm. is, right, is there one thing to remember when you walk on set or walk on stage? Is there one thing to remember to make the character come alive? Didn't we ask that question? I think already? we did. Did we ask that question? It's the loop. It's the loop. It's the Thomas. Okay. All right. Um, the last question I've got here is, can you just explain a little bit about the Alexandra method once again? Alexander called his, sorry. Alexander called his method uh, the use of yourself, meaning that um, you learn about your own habits, you learn about how you handle yourself, and you do this by recognizing how you're using your instrument from the balance of your head all the way down to your feet. Uh, Sarah was, in a way, doing some Alexander, whether she knew it or not. And uh, so we use ourselves every day, but we're unconscious of it. And uh, I think his technique is needed more than ever because we're uh, reactive creatures. We're, uh, we're filled with tension and constriction and repetitive motion. Basically, we hold ourselves. Don't move anybody, but just ask yourself, what, what are you doing right now? Do you know, are, are, you, are you holding your shoulders up or are you collapsing onto yourself? Are you, are you um, scratching yourself constantly without knowing that you're doing that? All these things you can use if you're aware, but the journey, the great journey that Alexander um, wanted people to discover is that our life in our body is an adventure and it never stops. I've been doing it for about 36 years, and I still take lessons myself, and, um, and it's, I'm constantly working on myself. It never ends. So um, if you don't know what it is, go and find a teacher. There's some excellent teachers in town. Go find out what it is. It applies to the actor tremendously, and it's uh, more valid than ever right now in the world that we're living in. And I certainly think what, what we're getting from, from, from these four wonderful people is the fact that the process does never end, that the investigation is always there, that we are servants, that we are obligated to be curious, to be healthy, to grow. We're living in the year 2017. We're kind of in trouble. Uh, as artists, we want to bring the best parts of ourselves, the unknown and the known, and very interesting from, 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 the, from these points of view is what we've heard, but there are obviously many techniques. Finding the technique, finding the method that will allow you in terms of developing character movement is very key. To be without that and simply to be stuck in the industry, that's tough. But to actually find that way that your curiosity is inexhaustible and you're willing to go that limit and keep discovering and keep growing I mean, that's a great privilege. We're all very fortunate. We're so fortunate to be in this, I don't want to say industry, you know, in this art, on these, on these art forms, because we get to explore that every day. And that's our job. And we look, and things are revealed, and we look again, and we look again, and things are revealed differently. And to be able to bring that, you know, into our work, and to constantly expand and constantly revolutionize, how wonderful is that? I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it, I think that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you very much for, for coming and for exploring. And thank you very much, 
Uh, I'm new here. I'm from Canada, right? But to know that this exists and that people are willing to grow and have discussions like this, let's never stop. Thanks, everyone.